All right, well, good morning. Welcome to Trinity this morning. You guys doing okay? You guys alive? All right. Hey, let's go ahead and stand as we worship this morning. Sing it with me. I was buried beneath my shade. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb until I met you. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. You were my tune till I met you. Sing it out, you call. You call my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness into your glorious day. You call my name. Because of his mercy, now your mercy has saved my soul. Your freedom, now your freedom is all that I know. Be your neighbor, Jesus. When I met you, you called my name. And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Put your hands together with me. Come on. Are we going to sing together? I need a rescue. Sing it with me. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. But chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call my name, I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness, into your glorious day. Father, we welcome you into this place this morning. God, thank you that we get to come, we get to gather together, uh, we get to celebrate your goodness, God, your faithfulness. God, we get to celebrate that you are an incredible, awesome, amazing God who loves us, God, who has a plan for us. And God, uh, we believe, God, we know that you're here today, that your spirit is here, that you are moving in this place. God that, um, God, that you have something incredible in store for us today. 
So, Father, we trust you. God, we invite you to come and have your way uh, this morning. Lord, speak to us. Speak to us, God. Speak to our hearts. Change us. Make us more like you. We love you. That's our prayer today. God, have your way. Turn it for good. I'm gonna 
I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory, yeah For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good Sing that with me You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good We sing that over our lives, over our circumstances this morning Whatever you're facing Whatever mountain stands in your way, God is bigger. And he's going to take. Take what the enemy means for evil. He's going to turn it for your good, for his glory. Would you declare that with me? You take. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy means for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Worship Him this morning. Continue to give Him all the glory, all the honor.
tell you, Father, you are great. There's none like you, none who compares to you. Father, be honored, be glorified in our lives. Be honored in this place this morning, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys could be seated this morning. Good morning. It is so nice to get to look at you guys, look at your faces instead of just the camera, but we welcome you this morning, yay! Um, and we're so glad you're here, and we're so glad that you guys are uh, joining us with the live stream as well. So if you would like to have a VIP seat like these people, you can check out our website or our app or your e-news, and there is a link for you to register for these VIP seats to get to come into church. There's something about coming in and being with other believers and just being together as a church family. Isn't it just, like, good for your soul? Um, so, yes, so we're so excited that you guys are here. Um, okay, we've got lots of business today, lots of things going on. So our... Um, Deacons, we've got some recommendations for new deacons, so check those out. For those of you who are, who are here, those names are on the back of your bulletin. So you want to check those out. We have Jason Jackson, Jack Chapman, Aaron LeBlanc, and Cody Mullen have been recommended. So for these next three weeks, we ask that you would pray uh, for these men who have been recommended uh, during this period. And I also want you to seek out and find these deacons that have served faithfully um, who are rotating off. So we've got Gene Kramer, Neil Hargrave, Derek Alexandranko, and Troy Bro. So please thank them for their service when you see them. Okay, and we also have um, a new opportunity for uh, a book study. It is called Be the Bridge, Pursuing God's Heart for Racial Reconciliation. This is a group for both men and women. It's going to be on Wednesday nights here at church from 6.30 to 8. Uh, you can register, but you want to register quickly because there are only uh, 10 seats available, I'm told. Um, email karen at trinitybible.org if you want to be a part of that group, Be the Bridge. Okay, let's see. What else do we have going? Oh, today is the last day to register for Staycation Bible School. Okay, Staycation Bible School is going to be awesome. You can invite neighborhood friends and cousins. I've got cousins and kids coming to my house the week of VBS. We're going to have a drive through pickup party. You pick up your kit. You're going to get everything you need for the week, including crafts and snacks and lessons. We're going to have our very own VBS dancers that our kids love doing videos. 
and we'll do video Bible stories on our Facebook uh, VBS page. So please check that out. Get, out. get everybody registered today. Today's the last day for that. And most importantly, today is Father's Day. So happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there. Yes, let's give them a hand. In children's ministry, we like to call fathers superheroes. And this week, we asked some of our kids about their hero dads, and this is what they had to say. So check it out. My dad is a superhero because he built our house and practices baseball with me. My daddy is a superhero because he makes the best recommendation in the world. My dad is a hero because he provides for the family. I love my dad. He is a superhero. My dad's a superhero because he's funny. My dad is a superhero because he loves helping others and he's a great leader. My dad's a superhero because he always acts like it when he's at home playing with me. My dad's a superhero because he's funny. My dad is a superhero because he throws us really high up into the sky. My dad's a superhero because he be looking like Thor. My dad's a superhero because he gives me food. My dad is a superhero because he provides for the family. My dad is a superhero because he makes me laugh. My daddy is a superhero. And I love you, Daddy. My dad is a superhero because he's awesome and he cares about us, plus he is Batman. My dad is a superhero because he helps us take care of our chickens and taught us how to ride four wheelers. My daddy takes the best eggs and white cake. Hey, Daddy! My dad has my dad's a superhero because he cares for me and he loves me. I love you, Daddy. Yes, I'm in, I'm in charge. Go home. <laughs> hey, good morning. My name is Marcel Bouillard. I'm one of the elders here at Trinity. And up with me today are some of the other elders who could be here today. Brian Burns, John Tetnowski, Shannon Guillory, Kurt Boudreau, and Chuck Reeves. And uh, we, we're, uh, we're, about to, uh, we're about to have a uh, once-in-a-lifetime congregational meeting. And... Um, and, and so let, let me just say this, because of the pandemic, quarantine, stay at home, whatever it is, this is a, this is a live stream congregational meeting with Trinity Bible Church. So having given due notice for the last three weeks in email, newsletters, uh, bulletins, and word of mouth, I guess, this meeting is called to order. And this is a rare meeting. It is called for the sole purpose of the calling or the approval or the affirmation, I should say, of a new senior pastor. Um, about two years ago, maybe a little longer, Dennis gave the elders a heads up that his retirement was coming, that it was imminent. And from that day forward, this group of men, plus those who aren't here with us this morning, began the process of praying and seeking the man that God would have to come to our church to take the spot that Dennis has so faithfully filled for 25 years. And so we began that process a long time ago. And then about a year and a half ago, we formed a search committee. And, and if, if, uh, if Stacy would put that slide up, these members of the church were chosen um, to represent a cross-section of our membership. And these folks work tirelessly. And, and I need to say this, even though he's standing behind me, but Shannon Guillory 
and John Tetnowski as elders served in that committee as well. And Shannon chaired that committee. And having done that before twice in my life, I know how much time it takes, how hard the process is, but we never did lose sight, and we don't want you to think we ever lost sight of looking for the man that God had been preparing all along. And so when you begin that process of 200 plus resumes and phone calls and emails and listening to sermon audition tapes, it's part of a process that God uses to prepare us as well as that man. And so having sifted through all those names, it became clear at the time that our search team visited Michael Kramer at his home church and at his home in Illinois that he was ideally and, and exactly the man that God had been preparing. At that point, we brought Cra Michael Kramer down, and he met with the staff. And Stacy, if you'd put the staff slide up. And each one of these staff members who are currently serving our church faithfully and also are in this transition of Dennis retiring as well as Marty and Tim having just retired, we're looking for the next man that God would call to lead our church. And they feel as well, unanimously, just as a search team, that Michael Kramer was in fact that man. So at that point, the uh, search team presented that candidate to the elders. And the elders as a group, and even though we had been kept informed at a distance, for the most part not even knowing Michael's name to the very end, we became familiar with Michael. Michael came down prior to last week and met with us, and, and it became clear to us that Michael was the man that God called for this job. And so then we began the process of presenting Michael to the congregation. And so even though we've got a small audience here, the real audience today is, is our live stream video, but it is the congregation or the membership of Trinity. And it is our privilege as members to affirm God's choice. And so this ballot that has been sent out is your opportunity to stand alongside that search team, this staff, these elders, and to, and, and to welcome Michael as God's man for us for the next season of our church. So just a couple of, uh, of, of, of numbers. It's not a typical congregational meeting because we don't have a physical quorum in the building and we don't have opportunities for questions. So on the ballot that you have received, if you're listening live or if you're sitting here, there's an opportunity with, uh, with elder information being presented, contact information for you to contact any of us with questions or concerns that you may have. Having said that, there are, there are 370 voting members of our church as of today. Our Constitution requires that a quorum be present at a meeting in order to have a, 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 an official congregational meeting. We have been given notice or taken the position, which I think rightfully so, that the casting of your ballot will constitute your presence at the meeting. The number of 246 is the number of votes that we need to have a quorum. That represents two-thirds of the voting members. And as the Constitution requires, an 80% vote of those who vote if we have a quorum are required to approve Michael Kramer. So many of you have already voted uh, because the ballots went out Friday. The last day to vote is next Friday. And I encourage you to vote not because it really is an election, and not because we're counting votes, but it, as I mentioned earlier, it's an opportunity for our church to stand alongside Michael and the search team and the elders and the staff to welcome him into our family and to be prepared for what God's got for us next as Trinity. So having said that, this meeting is adjourned. Uh, one last thing, if you haven't gotten an email ballot, there'll be some paper ballots out in the lobby. John has some in his hand for the few of us that are here if you haven't yet got a ballot. So thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Guys, hey, John, can you get that table for me? Don't hurt yourself. Yeah, yeah don't hurt yourself. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I'm hoping that Michael likes to... Uh, preach on a couch, because that'll be awesome to see you guys lift that up here every week. <laughs> Some of you guys may have shown up this morning uh, hoping to see Dennis. He's on vacation. Some of you guys may have shown up this morning hoping to see Michael. Uh, that was last week. You're a week late. Um, Dennis and uh, Michael are both uh, better speakers than me, they are uh, smarter than me, uh, but I have them both beat on charm and dashing good looks, so <laughs> at least you have something to look at. And some of you that heard Michael's sermon last week realize that I have not applied Michael's sermon 
and the point that said we need to take a posture of humility uh, in life. And so you are correct. I have not applied that yet. Um, one of the things I realized with all these people retiring, uh, Tim has already retired. Uh, you know, Marty is, is about to retire. Dennis is retiring. Um, that I actually am, will be the person on staff with the longest tenure. So, so it took me 18 years, but I can finally say I won, right? And, and you didn't know it was a competition, uh, but it, it actually is, um, and I win. So that's great. Um, anyway, enough of that, which, you know, adult church, so it's time to get serious. Right, so let's uh, take a look at God's word. When we when we look at God's word, when we uh, sit here in church, we have to remember that it's really more about a conversation and a dialogue with you and God, not necessarily an interaction with with yourself and me. And so, uh, let's take just a moment for for you guys to stop and just ask God to speak to you this morning as we look at His word. God, we do just ask you to uh, speak to us, take the words uh, out of Scripture and use it to uh, change our lives and transform our hearts. And we just pray these things in your name, amen. So last week, um, Shannon read off uh, Michael's resume. Uh, as kind of part of his introduction. And uh, so, some of you guys that listened to that, you, you remember hearing that. And, uh, and you know, he, he has received a PhD, and, and he's, he's written three books and, and all this, you know, fancy stuff. Um, and it made me think back to my very first experience writing a resume. As I sat listening to him, I, I thought, and some of you may remember this, what it was it like the first time you wrote a resume, and, and maybe even go back to think the first time you filled out a job application. What did that look like? Because a lot of times a job application is a form for you to really create a resume. Uh, and they want to know past work experience. They want to know references and all these things. Um, and so think back, how many of you can think back to your very first job application or resume, and it's pretty embarrassing some of the things that appeared on there. Maybe you were a young teenager, uh, stuff you wouldn't put on your resume today. Uh, you may remember writing that. You may remember some of those first things. Um, some of them might be embarrassing, but I think back to my own personal first job that I ever got, and the the past work experience was I have mowed lawns during the summer. That was the extent of it. I took my dad's lawnmower, I wrapped a rope around the handle, wrapped the handle around the seat of my bike, and I rode around my neighborhood and mowed lawns. And the money I made, uh, I thought I was rolling deep uh, as a 14, 15-year-old kid. So I'm filling out an application, and that's what I'm putting down. Um, now, if you, if you fast forward to, uh, I've graduated seminary, and I am looking for my first pastoral job. I'm applying with a church uh, for a job of youth pastor. This is what my resume, my work experience, would have looked like. Mowed lawns around the neighborhood. Then I worked at Skinny Dips. Thinking, what's that? Well, of course, it's a low-calorie soft-serve ice cream. Skinny Dips. Great name. Very confusing. Um, worked there for a, uh, a couple of years uh, or, or a year or so. Waited tables. Worked at McDonald's for a summer. Um, I worked at a, uh, a doctor's office in their uh, medical records department, uh, filing paperwork and and doing, getting death certificates signed and, and occasionally having to clean up 
uh, glass from a doctor's table. They got mad while he was talking on the phone and slammed it on the table, broke the glass everywhere, sent my files across the floor. So I had to pick up the files, refile the paperwork I'd already filed once, uh, clean up the glass, uh, file these death certificates. Uh, then I worked for a company that we built uh, CD-ROM towers. Uh, CD-ROMs are kind of irrelevant nowadays, but we built CD-ROM towers. So I start looking for a job. And, and at, we're, we're going through this process now. We want to know, are we hiring a person who we feel like can lead this church, who has an education and experience to pastor a church well? And that's what's great about uh, Michael and such a fit that he's got all of these experiences. So I'm graduating seminary, and somebody's looking at my resume, and, and they want to know what skills am I bringing to the table. They want to know, uh, do I have the passion and heart to lead their teens uh, closer to Jesus? My resume and my track record showed that I could swirl low-calorie ice cream and stack it on a waffle cone with perfection, that I could carry a lot of plates on a tray and get get your food to you hot as ordered, you know, that I could prep enough eggs for 400 McDonald's breakfast in about three hours, and that I could build, test, and ship a four-bay, eight-bay, or even a 16-bay rack mount CD-ROM tower that met government and military specifications. But when you looked at my resume, it left one question unanswered, and that was, could I lead ministry that gave students an opportunity to meet Jesus and grow deeper in their faith. And my resume did not show that. Uh, and yet we were blessed uh, to find a small church in a small town that had a godly, compassionate pastor who loved uh, and taught the Word of God just about as, as amazing as anybody I've ever heard. He loved me. He supported me. He let me play golf with him even though he knew uh, that it would put his personal health and safety in danger. Uh, I was able to get the ministry experience that I need and learn what it meant uh, to work at a church and be a full-time pastor. Um, during that time that we were interviewing with churches, um, I had successfully led a youth ministry as a paid staff for zero amount of years and zero amount of days. So I had, my resume showed I had the inability uh, to do that. And these churches that we're interviewing with are asking the question, what are you bringing to the table? What skills do you have? What resources are you bringing to the table? And today we want to look at a story where Jesus is asking that exact question. What do you have to offer what are you bringing to the table? What are your assets? We're in this middle of this series where we are uh, taking a look at questions that Jesus asked. We're taking a look at these, these questions, and sometimes underneath the question is something extremely uh, profound. And uh, so today we want to look at a story in Matthew 15. Uh, so I ask that you open up your Bible or open up your app, uh, Bible app to Matthew 15, uh, verse 29. And uh, Matthew 15, 29 is a story that's also found in Mark 8. We have, over the last month, jumped all around this story. Um, Dennis has jumped around it. Michael kind of jumped around it. And we've, we've jumped around it. Today, I want to land specifically on this story and kind of talk about what it can teach us about ourselves and trusting Christ. Um, and we want to dive deeper into it. So let me read through the passage. It says in Matthew 15, 29, we're going to read through 39. It says, Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing him lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet. And he healed them. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. And they praised the God of Israel. 
Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me for three days, and, I have not, and they have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry, or they may collapse on the way. His disciples answered, Where can we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied, and a few small fish. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground, then he took the seven loaves and the fish, and when they had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to disciples, and they turned to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was 4,000 men besides women and children. And after Jesus had sent the crowd away, he got into the boat and went to the vicinity of Magdan. So in this story, it starts out that Jesus is doing exactly what Jesus does, right? He's teaching, he's, he's healing, he's basically just being awesome. He's being Jesus, he's drawing crowds. Everywhere he goes, these crowds are gathering, they want to hear what he has to say, they want to see what he's going to do, and, and while Jesus is doing these miracles and performing these things, he's teaching uh, about God's grace and God's forgiveness and God's mercy to those who are broken. And it says in this passage that while these things are happening, that these people are amazed. This includes Jesus' disciples. They're watching all this, and they're, they're amazed. Um, they saw the mute speak. They saw the crippled walk and the blind see. And I'm sure that in amazement, the crowd is starting to believe, you know, this guy can do anything, right? But human nature, I, I think there's something interesting about human nature. And that human nature seems to be that we become less amazed at the amazing things, the more we are exposed to the amazing. Is that not right? So the more we see amazing things around us, we kind of get a little bit um, used to it. We kind of get inoculated to it. And I think this story, the disciples, we see them in that place where they've gotten a little bit less amazed with the amazing things that they're seeing Jesus comments to his disciples that he cares for these people. He deeply and passionately cares for them, and he has compassion on them um, because they have been with him for three days, and they they are hungry. And the disciples who has just seen amazing things become very logical and practical. It's very fascinating. They've seen him you know, heal the, the lame, the, the blind can see, the sick are healed. And all of a sudden, they are confronted with an issue, and they become very logical and reason. Out of, uh, w- they're like, we're out in the middle of nowhere. We can't buy any food. We don't have any food. They get extremely logical. And in that moment, Jesus asked the question that we want to take a look at this morning. How many loaves do you have? It's easy to pass by that and not stop and think about what are the implications of this very simple question. And that he's asking his disciples, what are you bringing to the table? Seven, they reply, seven loaves and two fish. So let's take a look at the implications of this question. First, I want to take a look at uh, the problem. If you're filling out your, your outline there, I know some of you can't go home feeling complete until you fill in the blanks. Uh, so the problem is, is that, that the, the problem, he's, he's established the problem, and that is what is it that needs to be fixed? What is it that needs to be fixed? In verse 38, he tells us that it was 4,000 men uh, plus women and children. So we can be talking about possibly 10,000 or more people. 10,000 hungry and amazed people. Um, that's a huge demand. Imagine that you're at the Cajun Dome and it's almost at full capacity. 
and you need to feed everyone. And they haven't eaten in three days, except for maybe a few little snacks that they've brought with them. Uh, Think about how you would feel in that situation. And now apply that to kind of our own daily living. How do we feel in life sometimes? Oftentimes, we feel like the demands of life far outweigh the resources at hand. Life has dumped 10,000 tasks at your feet. And you merely just don't have the assets or the resources to do or complete what you feel like has been been put in front of you. You survey the demands, they seem unsurmountable. The resources you have are surely not going to be enough for this situation. Or maybe it's not the quantity of task, it's just too large of a task. You are pla- something is placed in front of you that is just bigger than anything you have ever done. It is bigger than, than what you feel like your capacity is. It's of great importance. It has huge implications. And more times than not, the demands of life are just too high. And we begin to experience that pressure and we begin to maybe fold under the pressure that we feel from that. There is so much that needs to be done. Have you ever sat back in life? Have you ever sat back one day and went, I can relax now. There is nothing else to do. I mean, like, nothing. Like you're all caught up. Like you look at life and you think, I win. I'm caught up. There's nothing. We never feel that way, right? We never, ever feel that way. There's always more laundry, more projects, more work to be done, more everything. Uh, God has given the church the commission to go and make disciples, to take the gospel where? To the world. So then there's that on top of, of everything else that we feel like we need to do. There's always people that need to be reached, hurting people that need to be healed, lonely people that need a friend, young believers who need to be discipled, and the lost that desperately need Jesus. The work is never done in life. And it continues sometimes to feel like it's just piled on and the demand is just way too high. So when we ask the question, what needs to be fixed? The real answer is that people all over the world are trying to find the answers in the wrong places. Without Jesus... And people's attempt to fix this problem without Jesus, we see uh, pain, anger, we see racial division, we see selfishness, and we see hate flow through society. And yet this is a huge problem that needs to be fixed. Jesus and his disciples are faced with a problem that needs to be fixed. And so Jesus asked this question, how many loaves do you have? Which leads us to the second point of the solution. What assets are available? What assets are available? What do you bring to the table? How many loaves do you have? Here's a problem. What do we got? Uh, And there are several different ways. As I was studying through this scripture, I was hit with there's several ways that we can kind of grapple with this question. Or there are several ways that we hear this question or respond to this question. And some, some people would see the problem. They would see the, the Jesus, hear Jesus' question, and their response is, I can fix this, right? I can fix this. Um, have you seen my resume? You know, I've worked my whole life honing a certain set of skills. I got this. Don't worry, Jesus. I don't need your help. We look at the creator of the universe, and we say, sit back. Watch what I can do and be amazed. And oftentimes we approach life's problems that way. We dig in. I've got the skills I need to to accomplish this. So so we we work hard and we try to fix it ourselves. Um, I grew up believing that my dad could fix anything. 
All right? And I came to this conclusion because growing up, my dad fixed everything. <laughs> so I just came to the conclusion that he could fix everything. Um, and I appreciate being alongside my dad or doing these things with him. Sometimes I helped him. Sometimes I actually uh, inhibited his progress. But I was right there learning. Uh, and I feel like I learned how to fix a ton of things or at least feel like I, I could step in and fix that. I've saved myself so much money by fixing things myself. And I just appreciate that my dad was able to do that for me. I don't know if my parents are watching online. I just want to say thanks, Dad, for that. That's awesome, and happy Father's Day. I appreciate everything that he had done for me uh, in the midst of that. The problem with being a fixer is that you oftentimes overestimate your own ability, right? You cannot be a master of all tasks. You cannot know how to fix and repair everything. Guys go to school and they take tests and they get qualified and certified to do certain things. And then your average Joe like me gets in there and is like, oh, yeah, I can fix this. And we know just enough to do a lot of damage, right? Um, Gwen and I have spent the last month uh, traveling to the Dallas area trying to get uh, her mom's uh, house ready to sell. Some of you kind of know that the last couple of years for Gwen's family has been a really tough uh, couple of years. Gwen's father passed away a little over uh, two years ago, and then Gwen's mom passed away several years ago, and then Gwen's only uh, sibling and her sister passed away from cancer a few weeks ago, about six weeks ago. And so it's been a tough emotional road. Many of you guys have stepped out and, and reached into our lives in the midst of all this, and we thank you for that, and we, we feel your support and your prayers uh, in the midst of that. But, but we, we were tasked with, with dealing with their property and their home, and so we've spent some time over there packing some stuff up and work. So we were there last week. And it came, it's come time to kind of put the house on the market, and there was some minor repairs that needed to be done. And so I'm doing this. I'm replacing some, you know, uh, light switches with minimal electrocution and, uh, you know, replacing a ceiling fan and some things like that. And, and the tub faucet needed to be fixed. And so I'm fixing that. But instead of fixing that, I broke some stuff. And so what was a functional tub with just an older faucet it was now an unfunctional tub that needed to be repaired. And I actually realized that my attitude, my response, I can fix this, actually created more damage uh, than it was in the first place. So now we got to call all kinds of guys to come fix it. Gwen has to stay in in uh, Dallas for some more time so the guys can come and fix it. And there's consequences when we try to fix it on our own. And sometimes we need to realize we can't fix everything. Our resume and our skill set may not be what's needed for that moment. Others hear this question, and the question, how many loaves do you have? And they get this sense that, is that all you got? That's what they hear. Is that all you got? Jesus, uh, they see Jesus asking the question, and, and they hear him say, we have to feed 10,000 people, and you're bringing me eight loaves, seven loaves, and two fish? Uh, can't you do better than that? Many of us walk through life feeling this way, do we not? We, we, we do not feel like we possess the things that we need to complete the task beforehand. Jesus has asked me to have an impact on the world around me, and I have to give, and all I have to give is a life of brokenness. And, and we, we sense that everything about this question is filled with disappointment, regret, and shame. And Jesus says, what do you have? And we feel like what we have, we're kind of going, this is all I got. And Jesus is going, that's all you got? 
And that's how we interpret that. And so we have these two extremes. There's a problem, and some of us are like, I got this. I can fix it. And some of us are saying, I have nothing to offer that's of any kind of worth. If you look at the miracles that we have recorded in Scripture, this is the 24th uh, miracle kind of chronologically that Jesus has performed. Jesus has already miraculously fed a large crowd before, and even it was even a larger crowd than this one. You would expect this story to go something like this. Jesus says that he has compassions on the crowd. He wants to give them some food, and one of the disciples snatches up the bread and fish, hands them to Jesus, turns to the crowd, and says, now watch this. That's what you expect from these guys, right? But that's not what we get. Uh, I have seen God do amazing things over and over again. At times when I have felt overwhelmed, uh, unequipped, uh, and under-resourced for whatever life was throwing at me, uh, I have seen Jesus take what little I have Uh, what little I could offer, and to do miraculous things with that. And yet I still find myself doubting all over again when I face challenges, whether I can make it through. When facing tough times, when the mountain seems way too hard to climb, I forget the faithfulness of what God has done before. So Jesus is not asking you to fix it on your own. He is not disappointed that um, he is not disappointed that you don't have all the skills or confidence needed. He's not asking you to focus on your resume, but instead he's asking you to take all that you have and give it to him and trust in his resume. What Jesus is really saying is, give me all you got. Give me all you got. And what this implies is that, Jesus, that I recognize that what I have to offer is not enough. But it's everything that God needs. It's not enough to solve it without him, but it's everything he needs. He wants me to give all that I got recognizing that it's not enough, but it's exactly what he wants. And I give it to him with an attitude of hope and expectation. So the the problem is over 10,000 hungry, tired people. The solution is seven loaves, two fish, and Jesus. And that leads to, what? A surplus. After everyone ate and the disciples gathered up seven baskets of leftovers. I love that part of the story. Seven baskets of leftovers. They start out, I, I just, I can't imagine what this looks like. You know, where, where is the miracle happening? You know, is, do I have a loaf of bread, and I'm pulling some off, and the loaf is not getting any smaller. Um, you know, I, I don't, I, I've imagined it in so many different ways. Um, or is it that Jesus has these seven loaves, and he keeps handing them out to the disciples, and, and there's just an abundance of loaves? I don't know how this happens. But what he's, what he's got here is a situation with limited resources. You add Jesus to it, And the problem is fixed, the miracle happens, and there's surplus left over. Usually, the way we interpret giving Jesus what we have is if I give Jesus, if I give God everything that I have, then I have nothing left. If I give it all, then I have nothing left. But the truth is, is Jesus' math, it's kind of like common core math. It doesn't make sense. Um, 
If you give all that you have, you come out with more than you started with. And I love that. The outcome on your, uh, on your outline, the outcome is 7 plus 2 plus Jesus equals 7. That's basic common core math right there, right? 7 loaves plus 2 fish plus Jesus equals seven basketfuls of full, baskets full of leftovers. It is uh, an amazing reality that when we give, when we feel like we are being drained of all that we have, have you ever said out loud, I have nothing left to give? We find ourselves there so many times. I know uh, when we're packing up, when we, Gwen and I have been doing so much over the last four to six weeks that we have sat and just said, I don't, I don't have anything else left to give. And what Jesus is saying is, is that whenever it comes to his mathematics, that when we bring him into the equation, when we give all that we have to him and allow him to be a part of the solution, that there is an abundance and there is leftovers. So we need to remember to not try to make it on our own. We need to remember to not try to make things happen through our own strength. Don't find yourself with the attitude in, in life of, I can fix this. Life is going to bring us heartache. Life is going to bring us challenges. Uh, there are great and mighty tasks at hand in regards to parenting and marriage and, and uh, church and ministry. There are so many things out there, and we cannot wake up and say, I got this. Because when we do, we break things, and it requires somebody else to step in and begin to fix that. Also, don't allow yourself to become convinced that what you have is unworthy. Don't allow the, Satan's lies to step in and to diminish what you have to offer. So I have to find the ability to walk in the balance between these two extremes. Um, I'm, not, I'm not the fixer, but I also am not that I don't have anything to offer. And so what Jesus wants us instead to do is he wants us to take all that I have, he wants us to give it to him, and then he wants us to step back and say, watch this. And those are the times that God will be evident, that God will move, and the result will be a, a surplus. So pray with me this morning. As we asking God, um, coming before him, God, we, we said before you this morning, uh, a group of people who are, um, in so many ways, we find ourselves stretched. In so many ways, we find ourselves tired. Um, we find ourselves... Um, scared, uh, fearful, uh, unequipped. The tasks before us seem insurmountable. And God, I just pray that you will help us to find the balance. The balance between thinking we can do it all our own or thinking that we have nothing to offer that in the middle, we will find the ability to give you everything that we have and watch you work. So when the question is asked, how many loaves do you have? We would look at our gifting, our experience. Maybe it's the things on our resume Maybe it's just experiences and talents and skills that we have that we would lay those things before you 
and watch how you use them to impact the lives of people around us and the world. God, we just love you. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Um, we are ending this morning without singing a final song. We thought the, uh, we, we've got a few minutes left. So uh, I just want to say thank you uh, for coming. We so appreciate and love having you here. Uh, we actually, this service is our uh, COVID survivor service. I don't know if you noticed the people at our church uh, who got COVID, I think are all here this morning almost. And so uh, we celebrate with you the fact that, that your health and, um, and that God has brought you guys through the midst of that. Um, and um, anyway, what a great joy to be here. Some of you, this might have been your first time to come live um, and be a part of it. Uh, and so how exciting that is. Uh, as, we, um, as we dismiss, I want to let you know that we have offering plates in the back. We did not pass an offering plate. Um, and so we've got, you can drop off offering uh, in the baskets that are in the back. And we're going to just ask that everybody uh, exit out the back because as people are showing up for the next service, we want to kind of keep traffic flowing um, this way. And so the people that are on this side, if y'all can exit that way, and these people, if y'all can exit that way, um, that would be awesome. But my, my final encouragement to you as you go throughout this week um, is, is to give God all that you got and then just step back and, and just watch what happens. Thank y'all for coming this morning. We'll see y'all either online or live in the weeks to come. Thank you. Thank you.